Good morning. My name is Jay Hoppala. I work for AARP. And we have an office in St. Paul. Seven of us work there, and we do our best to cover the whole state. So it's a nice opportunity to get down here to Cannon Falls. And it's good to see many of you again. I came to the Triad Conference the last few years and had a good experience with that. And I appreciate the good work that you're doing, not just to keep your community safe, but to create a community. By being involved with Triad and making connections with each other, you're really uh, holding on to what is missing from a lot of places I visit, where uh, senior groups or civic groups are dwindling and they don't have the membership that they used to have. So you should be proud of the work that you're doing together to keep a strong community here in, uh, in southeastern Minnesota. So I appreciate you inviting me to be here with you. Um, AARP, we partnered with the FBI uh, and actually the FBI approached us about five years ago for the purpose of educating the public about fraud and identity theft and cybersecurity. And the reason, a couple of reasons they approached us were one, they have a very difficult time uh, investigating financial crime and prosecuting financial crime because the con artists are just very good at covering their tracks. They wouldn't do their, their crimes, they wouldn't get up and do their job in the morning if there was a risk of getting caught. The, the criminals who were at risk of getting caught already were caught. The ones who are dialing the phone today, the ones who are uh, planning cyber attacks today, they know they're not going to get caught. So the FBI approached us knowing we could reach a lot of people with the information, educate folks about these issues, and prevent the crimes from happening before they do. That's really the only way that we can stop financial crime. So in addition to receiving access to the FBI's undercover audio and video recordings of their sting operations, uh, AARP's fraud fighter volunteers and myself, over the past, say, 18 months, we have um, visited with over 250 community groups like yours. Just this morning, I was in West St. Paul at a Rotary Club meeting and, and hearing how people are being targeted by scams today, right now, today. And I'll bet some of you have been targeted by scams as well as they have been in West St. Paul. So who here has been targeted by a scam? Lots of people. So everywhere I go, people are being targeted by financial crime. Who wants to tell us about a scam that you've been approached by? Yes, at the ladies' table back here. Mine is one of them that you read about all the time. Yeah. Hi, Grandma, this is... Mexico and I need some money to get out of jail. I thought, no, no, no. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So she just described the grandparent scam, and it's typically a phone call. Sometimes it's an email. But if you pick up the phone, usually you just hear one word. And they say, Grandma or Grandpa. And then they wait. You know, and maybe they said, Grandma, this is, or maybe they just said, Grandma. And then you say, is that you? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's me, Grandma. What are you, are you losing your mind? It's your granddaughter. And they didn't know their name before you told it to them. Then they come on with a story. I'm, you know, Grandma, I'm down here in Mexico. I'm on spring break, and I got into trouble. I was going to try to solve this for myself, but I can't. I'm running out of time. I was drinking, I was driving, and I crashed the rental car. They got me here in the holding cell at the jail, and they say at 5 o'clock today, they're going to put me in the real prison with the rest of the criminals unless you send me the money to pay some fines. I promise when I get home we'll make everything right. I'll tell mom and dad. But you can't tell them right now because you know they're going to make a big mess out of this. I just need to have this money before 5 o'clock today to get, out of, to get out of jail. And I can't tell you how many people I've met who, one, have sent the money, or two, they were already on their way to the bank at midnight to get that money before they realized that they were being tricked. So who else has been targeted? Yes, sir. To uh, add to that, there's some evidence that they were using the obituaries sure. to gain uh -huh. information as to who the grandparents was. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I, it really used to be that I would, I would talk to people and they would say, you know, how did they know my grandchild's name? And most of the time it was just kind of that cold call. but. Now there's evidence, like you say, that um, they're using the obituaries, you know, of course, survived by grandchildren, Joey, Johnny, and Samantha, or whatever the names are. 
or two, they're using Facebook to um, find out the names of grandchildren. And I'll tell you how easy this is to do. You don't even need a Facebook account. So go to Facebook.com, type in the phrase in the search bar, Happy Birthday Grandma, and then you can find the profile of Grandma and Granddaughter, and Granddaughter is telling Grandma, Happy Birthday Grandma. Then you look up Grandma in the phone book and find out her, her address and phone number, right? Here's what can happen in 2016. <clears throat> you know, often, you know, granddaughter's up in and you know she's not in Mexico. If I was in Mexico right now, I could take pictures of young people, use those pictures to search the internet. So I'm not searching with text or with words, I'm searching with a picture, and it's going to find other, with facial recognition technology, it's going to find a picture of that person who's in Mexico. Now I'm calling their family who know full well that they are in Mexico. That's legitimate technology. You can, it's Google. With Google, you can search facial recognition technology and find someone's social media profile along with all of their familial connections. So one more. Who else has been targeted by a scam? Miss. Just a call from the you know, where it says this is the IRS calling. Mm -hmm. And that one is ridiculous. We just hang up, but I mean, I'm sure somebody probably does feel they owe the money. You know, who knows? Oh, sure. It's happening. Obviously, it's uh, right before the tax filing deadline right now. So it's the number one scam um, being perpetrated. Uh, and it's a phone call, and it typically sounds like this you pick up the phone, and they say, don't hang up. You must have been screening your calls for the last six months. Uh, we've been trying to reach you. We've been trying to help you to pay these back taxes. But because it's been so long, uh, your time is almost up. And if you don't pay these taxes by Friday afternoon, there's nothing we can do to stop all the bad things from happening to you. We're going to freeze your bank accounts. We're going to seize your property. And in fact, I have a a message right here. I'm going to file this report with the federal marshals, and they're going to come to your house and arrest you. But all of your problems can go away if you just give me your credit card number right now. So very simple. Very simple. All things considered, on public radio last week had a sample, uh, and I brought it along. So if we have time uh, at the end of the session, I'll, I'll play it for you. It's about two minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really powerful because it starts out with that feeble uh, voice, or, and then the threats, and then the threats get louder. And, uh, very powerful. Yes. There was a case in which the con artist got a hold of the 12-year-old daughter, and, we're try and mom and dad weren't home. And so they tried to coerce the young daughter by telling her, you know, your parents are going to lose the house, you're going to be homeless, just go in the purse and get one of their credit cards and you can save your family from becoming homeless, right? Imagine a 12-year-old girl. You know, think being told that from the IRS that her family is going to be homeless unless she just goes to the person and gets the credit card, right? Wouldn't it be nice if these criminals were decent people like you and me and wouldn't take advantage of vulnerable people or young people? But that's exactly who they're looking for. If they meet someone, if they get someone on the phone that says buzz off, they just hang up the phone and they call someone else looking for someone who's vulnerable. That's why it's so important for groups like Triad, um, who have members who are capable and able to come down here to the community center, uh, to reach out to your neighbors and others who might be more vulnerable, more isolated, and unable to get this kind of information directly. You had a question? I recently read in the paper where parents should discuss their situation with their children and tell them there are no financial problems. Mm -hmm. we're, we're fine, you know, just to let the kids know that they're secure, maybe that would help if a call like this came. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I think maybe especially in Minnesota, uh, we hold this value that we don't discuss our finances with the family, with the children, uh, with each other, with our friends, right? Why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, because of our heritage, because that's our a value that we are raised with, but how does it serve us well in 2016? Now, I mean, crime is one thing, but even when it comes to planning for our futures and planning for aging, how does it serve us well to not, to keep those kind of secrets from each other, especially with family members we can trust? So, 
thanks for sharing. Again, it's been proven over and over again that these con artists are targeting us uh, everywhere from you know East Grand Forks to Cannon Falls and everywhere in between. So in addition to what I've learned from our FBI analysis and uh, meeting with so many community groups, last summer um, we were fortunate enough to bring Frank Abagnale to Minnesota to talk with our volunteers and do a presentation for the public. Frank Abagnale is the subject, his life is the subject of the movie Catch Me If You Can. Um, Frank Abagnale was a con artist and an identity thief and a check forger back in the 60s and 70s. Um, he was arrested, he was spent time in prison, and as a condition of his release from prison, he consulted with the FBI and helped them catch other con artists and criminals, and he continues to do so today. And we did some interviews with him. I want to play some of those, those video clips for you, and then we can discuss um, what he has to share with us as well as whatever other questions you have. So first I'll play his introduction. Uh, my name is Frank Abignale. I'm a consultant. I've been a consultant to the FBI for over 40 years and worked with a lot of corporations and governments around the world over the last four decades. Uh, most people know me from the movie Catch Me If You Can. Uh, I was someone who, at the age of 16, ran away from a broken home and impersonated an airline pilot, a doctor, a lawyer, wrote about two and a half million dollars worth of bad checks. Uh, till I was 21 and arrested in France, served time in French prisons, Swedish prisons, and was sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. Uh, when I was 26, I was paroled from prison to uh, the federal government where I was a part of my parole. When the parole was over, I stayed on and been doing that for the past four years. That's who he, who he is, and he visited with us last summer at, you might recognize, the Minnesota History Center. That's where we held our meeting. He said most of his career he spent consulting with banks and with corporations, and he's very happy to be working with AARP because we're focused on the consumers. How do consumers protect themselves? So it was very interesting meeting with him. I'll play another one where he gives us some advice. Yeah. The reason you want to be educated in Minnesota or anywhere else in the world about identity theft and fraud and scams is because education is absolutely the most powerful tool to prevent those crimes. You really can't rely on the police, the government, or your bank to protect you. You have to be a little smarter, a little wiser consumer today than you did 20 years ago. So getting an education about what's going on and how to protect yourself is the most important thing you can do to keep yourself from being victimized. So as I've just um, embarked on my education about identity theft and consumer fraud. <clears throat> what I've learned quite clearly is that our information is out there. It's, we have an obligation and a responsibility to safeguard our information, our social security numbers, our credit card numbers and bank account information, even personal information like our addresses and phone numbers and email addresses. We have an obligation to do that. But <clears throat> In the United States of America, our government isn't going to let individuals like you and me go bankrupt because our information was compromised, right? Target was hacked and all of their financial records and credit card records were hacked. Uh, some of the worst cases of identity theft in Minnesota, the most costly cases, have come because, because of, uh, not because of the consumer's responsibility, but because disgruntled employees who legitimately had access to uh, consumers' financial information um, stole that information. So mortgage brokers who were laid off during the financial crisis of the you know, recent times uh, lost their jobs and they decided they were going to take with them boxes of mortgage records and sell them to identity thieves. You, that, that's not within your realm of responsibility. All of our information is out there, and that's why 
um, where we have consumer protections in place. We're going to talk about your credit card liability and <clears throat> really what our obligations are to be monitoring our accounts and our financial transactions and monitoring our credit reports. Other than that, our financial liability for identity theft is very limited despite what you might see advertised in these services that, are, uh, that you can pay for to protect your identity and to protect your finances from loss. I'll play another of the videos. Well, identity theft is a big thing now. We have about 15 million victims a year, or one every two seconds in the United States. Because if I can become you, what I can do as you is limited to my imagination. So I can get credit in your name, get a job in your name, buy a car in your name, get a mortgage in your name, or ultimately commit a crime in your name, just to list a few. They only need three pieces of information, your name, your date of birth, and your social security number. And sometimes there are telephone solicitation calls where they ask you that information. They say you're your bank and they're verifying that you are who you say you are. Sometimes it comes in the form of a uh, email to you that they need to verify that information and want you to pass, put up your password or your social security number or your date of birth. And of course, I'm very much so in social media. Because if on Facebook you tell me where you were born and your date of birth, then I'm 98% of stealing your identity. So you never want to stay on a social media site such as Facebook where you were born and what your date of birth is. Otherwise, your mouths will say, come steal my identity. It doesn't take a lot of information. It doesn't. Um, I want to talk about the top scams in Minnesota right now or the top categories of scams in Minnesota right now. Um, number one on the list is imposter scams. It's like the grandparent scam or the IRS scam that we just discussed. The con artists have realized it's a lot easier to just pretend they're your grandchild rather than go through all the trouble of trying to access your social security date of birth and, and um, your name. So it's easier just to trick people uh, into sending money based on a story that they've made up very easy. Um, but number two still in Minnesota is identity theft and credit card theft. And <clears throat> most people are most anxious about um, their identity being stolen online. And there are steps we need to take to make sure we're safe online. Most of us know, if not all of us know, not to click on a link in an email that we don't expect or that we don't recognize. You get your spam emails and they're in your inbox and you might recognize them or you just don't trust them. That having them in your inbox does not put you at risk. Once you open that email and click on a link, now you might be downloading a file that could cause problems for your computer, whether it's malware or a virus or um, uh, the ransomware that is now uh, so powerful and popular with the computer hackers. So we know not to click on those links or download files. One case in Granite Falls, um, the victim was coached over the phone to press the Windows key and the R button at the same time. Does anyone know what Windows and R means? It's the shortcut to download a file. So you know not to click on a link, but most people don't know that uh, Windows and R button and then the computer hacker would tell you some gibberish to type into the, into the text field. Uh, and now you're downloading a file from the internet that could compromise your computer. So we need to keep our security software up to date. And <clears throat> the best way to do that, or the best way to know if it's time to update your security software on your personal computer, is if you get a lot of pop-up ads then um, your security software is up to date or out of date. <clears throat> the ad creators that make those pop-up ads and the security software developers, they're at war. Because if your job is to develop ads, your job is to get through the security software so you can advertise your product. And then the security software developers figure out how to block those ads, and then the ad developers figure out how to bypass the security software. So it's time to update your security software on your computer if you get a lot of pop-up ads. 
Now, <clears throat> with our devices, with your iPads and your smartphones, or even if you take your laptop down to the coffee shop, people, you as individuals, if you use those kind of wireless Wi-Fi devices, or the rest of your family, if they use them, they probably don't realize that public Wi-Fi is insecure and someone on the same Wi-Fi network can access the other devices that are on that same network. So if at home you have Wi-Fi and you have a unique password to access it and only your family knows it, your Wi-Fi is as secure as your password is. But if you're at the coffee shop and you, all you have to do is ask the barista or the library, you ask the librarian what's the Wi-Fi password for the day and everyone has the same one, they can access each other's devices through that network. There was a story in USA Today about a month ago and it was <clears throat> from a writer who was writing a story about how the FBI wants to hack the iPhone to get the terrorists information, right? You've heard of this? Yes. Yeah, well he started writing an article about that, about this unhackable iPhone, and he was emailing his boss about it on his iPhone while accessing the public Wi-Fi on an airplane. He was writing some of the article and sending uh, paragraphs and drafts to his boss. He was getting off the plane and someone a few rows back from him uh, said, hey mister, I want to talk with you when you get off the plane. So he was annoyed but he, for some reason he said that he waited at the end of the jetway and, and waited for this guy. Guy came up to him and said, so I see you're writing an article about the FBI and the iPhone and Apple. Well how'd you know that? I hacked your iPhone through the public Wi-Fi. So you can't hack an iPhone, the FBI can't hack an iPhone unless it's connected to the Wi-Fi. Then anyone can do it. The hacker said, I hacked your phone, I hacked her phone, I hacked the other guy's phone. He had four hours on the flight and he was bored, so he was just seeing what everyone else is doing. Yeah, yeah. So tell your family they shouldn't be entering, pat you, on the Wi-Fi you can play games, check the weather, even check your email. What someone can access through the Wi-Fi is your keystrokes. That's the data that's being sent through the network. So if you're typing an email, this writer said, I'm glad I wasn't bad-mouthing my boss on, in my email because those keystrokes, those sentences he was typing, could be monitored. Um, if you entered a 16-digit number, what would that be? Credit card number, right? Credit card number. Um, if you entered your email address followed by 10 random digits and characters, it's probably your login to a certain account with your email address and your password. So it's just the keystrokes. They can't see your screen, but they can, they can monitor your activity. They can monitor what you're typing. So most people are anxious about their identity online. Um, phishing scams also online. You get a fake email. They say this is your bank, your account has been compromised, and we need you to verify the following information about yourself. You know, we need to verify where those are coming from. But those are the main ways that we can stay safe online. More likely, people like you and me are going to be victim of identity theft or credit card theft in the real world instead of on our computer. Um, I was visiting Orono, Minnesota, and Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, when their police department representatives had a chance to speak, both of them said, we have a real problem here with mail theft. With mail theft. That was the number one thing they wanted to talk about. And your mail has become more valuable than it has been in the past because your personal checks aren't monitored the way they used to be. There's no, you put your check in the mail, and there may not be another set of human hands or human eyes that ever touch it. A machine opens the envelope, the check goes down the conveyor belt or something, and a camera takes a picture of it. There's no one monitoring your check numbers, your sequ sequential check numbers. If <clears throat> I had a copy of one of your personal checks, it would be very simple to erase the ink from it. Uh, those chemicals are widely available. So then I would have one of your checks. If I wanted to spend more of your money, I would take your routing number, your 
account number, and then I would look into the future of your sequential check numbers. I would go to a website and I would order a whole case of your checks with, uh, connected to your bank account with my name on it. So even if anyone bothered to check my ID when I paid with a personal check, which they typically don't, um, I would be able to show my own ID and spend money directly from your check account, checking account. If I didn't want to wait a week for the shipment of checks to come, I'd have software on my computer where I could just print one check off at a time. Anytime I wanted to write myself a personal check out of your account, I could just print one off on my printer at home. That technology is available and legitimate, and the check thieves can use it. Did you have a question? Uh, just a comment. Exactly what you just described is what happened to my husband and I. Yeah. Who our Wells Fargo checking account. And I check my things online, on a, not on a wireless, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the checks that are in, and our current check numbers were like 5,000 and something. And all of a sudden, there's a check that has come through, mm -hmm. and it's 55,000 and something. Wow. My check all of my numbers, oh but a man's name and an address in Florida. Sure. He didn't exist, but Wells right. Fargo straightened it out. Yes. But it took yeah. a long time. <laughs> yeah, good question. What is the defense against that? Our information is out there. Those checks are, you know, images of them are stored in computers that, uh, you know, maybe the most honest people in the world have access to those computers, or maybe, you know, someday that honest computer administrator gets fired from their job and they decide they're going to steal some data. Our information is out there. Um, and here, I'll tell you the good news. I <laughs> do these presentations and I always say, you know, at some point we're all going to be really depressed and we're going to want to get off the grid and unplug the computer and cut up our credit cards and all of that. Go cash only, right? Uh, but there's good news. Like I think I was just saying that in the United States of America, we're not going to make people bankrupt because your information was accessed and it was totally out of your control. I'll start from the beginning when it comes to your liability for financial transactions, electronic transactions. These are conveniences that your bank offers you and your credit card company offer you because they want to hold on to your money. They want to make interest off your money. And because of that business arrangement, our federal government has put consumer protections in place because your identity could be uh, compromised. So people have this misconception that debit cards are less secure than credit cards. And that's not true. It's the exact same technology. You have a magnetic stripe that holds your data or you have the EMV chip, the microchip on your credit card. Or you have both. The newer cards typically have both. How many of you have received a new EMV chip card from your bank? So about half, yeah. Um, you'll be getting them soon if you don't have one yet. If you have a credit card or a debit card without the chip, your bank's going to replace it soon. <clears throat> The difference between your debit card or personal checks or an electronic transfer connected to your bank account, <clears throat> you have 60 days to report a, re a fraudulent transaction to your bank. With your credit card, you have 90 days. That's really our obligation as consumers is we monitor our accounts, we monitor our credit reports, and if there's any fraudulent transactions, we report them to our bank, our bank is obligated to replace our losses within 10 days, even if the investigation is still underway. I've heard some unsettling stories from people whose credit card was stolen, not physically, but the data was stolen and someone used it in Texas or Florida or who knows where. They used it and the bank employee has said, well, how are we supposed to know that wasn't you? Uh, it was a legitimate business that charged your card, so how can you prove to us that you didn't spend that money? And that's unethical behavior. The bank is the institution responsible for investigating the transaction, and they have to give consumers their money back within 10 days. So I wouldn't go as so far as to say those banks are breaking the law, but I would say they're putting unfair pressure on consumers 
uh, who sometimes back off and say, okay, I guess you're right. So know that if your credit card is compromised or your debit card is compromised or someone writes a personal check in your name, your bank does the investigation. You get your money back within 10 days. So now on to the, the EMV chips. EMV is an acronym. It stands for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. And those three credit card companies created a new technology in the microchip that helps them limit their liability for, for fraudulent transactions. So what the chip does, <clears throat> each time you use it in the, in the EMV chip reader, is that it transmits a unique number. So you use it at Target, it transmits one number, go to Home Depot, it's a different number, you go to the gas station, it's a different number. If the hackers hacked Target and got that data, that number would be useless because the next time that card is used, it transmits a different number. So those chips prevent that type of credit card theft from the mass hacking of, of credit card records. But they don't really protect consumers because even if someone stole your data from Target or elsewhere, um, all you would have to do is report the fraudulent transaction. Now with the chip, if, say, the gas station down the street doesn't have an EMV chip reader and they accept a fraudulent transaction, the bank doesn't have to pay them. That's what changed with the EMV chips. If someone stole your credit card, and it, even if it has a PIN number associated with it, you go to Target and you got to type in the PIN number when you put it in the EMV chip reader, does it also have a magnetic strip? Yeah. So I just wouldn't go to Target with the chip reader where they make me use the card in the chip reader. I'd go to Amazon.com and use your credit card there. So it really doesn't protect us. It's a liability shift to the retailers from the financial institutions. And that's important. I mean, your certified deposits in your savings account make two cents a year because all these banks are paying for all the fraud. So it's important. But I think a lot of the advertising we see about identity theft is just trying to scare us uh, into thinking that we're less secure than we are um, and to take on more responsibility from the financial institutions. So any questions about that? Yes. I think the banks are going even further. They're going to compromise your about six weeks ago. Um, was at home one day, got a call from a firm in North Dakota that a merchant's bank in Canada Falls, or a merchant's system is working with. And they're monitoring uh, your uh, usage of your card. So we get this call. Are you in, uh, <clears throat> are you home? Yes. Uh, well, somebody has uh, rung up six, six transactions up around the uh, west, west of the cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, no, we're home. Well, so they cut it off right there. Mm -hmm. So I called Merchants Bank and they said they're, they are uh, working with a professional firm that somehow monitors your cards. Anybody else have this happen? I have. And uh, like you said, Jay, the merchants said, we'll have your money back in 10 days. There's no problem there. And then they work with this company and trying to find out who this individual. But somehow, evidently, use the debit card at, I think, a Walmart, because this is where they were using it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what these things are, Jay, but there's some kind of reader. That mm -hmm. People stick them on the readers at Walmart. Mm -hmm. That's the only, thing, only way I can figure out that you got this card number. Yeah. Yeah, so first of all, yes, the banks have very sophisticated systems and they're working with contractors who monitor our behavior and if something out of the ordinary is happening with our spending, uh, it trips their red flag and they're not going to pay those transactions until they verify them with us. I've invited uh, bankers to come do these presentations with me and tell us more about how they do that and they've declined because they don't want you, one of you might be a criminal, right? And they don't want you to know, they don't want you to know there's what they've invested in. So that's fair enough. And the banks are investing so well in those systems 
not so much to protect you and me, but to protect their interests. Because if they don't catch it, and you catch it, and then you tell them, now they've paid it, and now they have to pay you back. So that's why they've invested so well in those. And yes, as I keep saying, our information is out there and vulnerable. So you're using your credit card at Walmart, for example. One more comment on that. When they called me, knowing me, you guys, I didn't know who I was talking about. Yeah. You know, I said, I went through quite a rigmarole, and I said, uh, I'd like you to give me your name and phone number. I want to call Merchants Bank and find out and I'll get back to you. Because I didn't, you know, yeah. Who was I talking with? That's a very good point. You know, that incoming call asking you about your personal information. I mean, some of the, the worst cons are people who know, they, the con artist has, has ripped them off once. You know, they won the lottery or something and they sent money. Now a different con artist calls them and says, well, I'm with your bank. We heard you got ripped off. Um, we'll help you recover your funds. In fact, we know who these guys are. You just got to pay us $500 to do it, right? And now you're paying the same con artists again. So <clears throat> credit card acts, you know, you shopped at Walmart. Sure, it could have happened at Walmart. You know, data records could have been hacked. Someone could have took a case of credit card receipts or day-end reports with credit card numbers on them out of the store. But we've heard of the skimming devices at the gas pump, right? Yeah. You've seen the security tape on the gas pump. Con artists have been, credit card thieves have been able to pry open the gas pump. They install a device and it copies uh, credit card data. Then they can use it or more often they sell it elsewhere. That's why the transactions pop up in, in Texas or, or wherever the transactions pop up. I watched a video on YouTube the other day of two criminals going into a gas station one of them distracted the cashier by asking for a pack of cigarettes or something. The other guy had a device that fit over the credit card reader. So it wasn't in the gas pump, it was at the point of sale. And it looked like the top of the credit card reader and it fit right over the top. And then they would come back and retrieve it the next day, right? So that happens. And a le legitimate piece of technology is called a cube. And it would fit into my cell phone here right where I charge it. And it allows me to accept credit card payments legitimately. So let's say I was a farmer and I sold my vegetables at the farmer's market and on the weekends and you wanted to buy some zucchinis or something and I would charge you on your credit card and that's legitimate. But then on the weekdays I work at the retail store and I'm a cashier and I take my same device with me and have it in my pocket here and you pay me with your credit card and I swipe it in the machine and I say, well, this doesn't work. What's your credit card? And I swipe it in my device, right? Pretty simple. Pretty si and that's legitimate technology I could be using to, to steal credit card data. A couple of years ago, I used my debit card in the Twin Cities for gas. Mm -hmm. And I did a little shopping and came home. And an hour or so later, my bank called me and said, are you at home? Yes. Well, your credit card was just used in England. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, obviously, I'm not in England. Mm -hmm. So I, waited, I had to get a new debit card, and they did, you know, reimburse my account. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it goes to show you, you know, if I was a small-time uh, credit card thief, I might steal your credit card information and just go shopping with it. If I was a big-time organized criminal, I would have connections in England where I don't need to put myself at risk for using your credit card and use my identity to use your credit card. I have a connection in England and I can just sell your credit card number for, I don't know, 100 bucks, 500 bucks, and that's how I make my money. So it's organized crime. Let's play another one of the videos, if I can make this work. Stay in bed. What the citizens of Minnesota need to know about being safe online is very simple. First of all, no government agency, no financial institution is going to send you an email and ask you personal information. So the minute you see that email, you immediately get away from it. 
don't go on to any link where you get an email and there's a link for you to link to to go on to get further information. Uh, those are just scams to get, get information from you. And third, if you get an email from, say, Microsoft telling you that they need to get into your computer because there's some malware in your computer and they need to fix it and delete it, they're only trying to access your computer. And once they get into your computer and they steal all of your information, your photos and all your memories and everything else, then they're going to come back to you and tell you that they want so much money from you to release that information. That's a double scam because they scammed you first to get into your computer and now they're telling you if you give them the $500 or the $1,000, they'll put the information back. They will never, ever put the information back. They're bad people. They have no intention of putting it back. So then you get scammed twice. I have nothing against social media sites. But if you have going to be on Facebook, you don't want a straight photograph of yourself on Facebook. There are technologies today like PitPat that are facial recognition softwares that tie back to your Facebook page. And people can take a photograph of you in a train station or an airport and immediately get to your Facebook page through facial recognition. So if I'm going to have a photo on my Facebook page, I want a picture of me with a group of my friends and my arms around them. I'm playing tennis, volleyball, I'm doing some sport activity, but never a straight on photograph. I never want to state where I was born, and I never want to state my date of birth on my Facebook page, otherwise you're just telling somebody to come steal your identity. So you have to be very smart about using Facebook, understanding that everyone's going to see that information, even though you may retrieve it, they can retrieve, delete it, they can retrieve it back. Some new information there, huh? Yeah. So, and a lot of, you take photos with your smartphone, that comes often with location data. So taking pictures of the grandkids out in the backyard on the smartphone, unless your settings are set properly and you post that picture online, now they know your latitude and longitude just by looking at that picture, right? Yeah. So I think what I'd just like to do for the whatever time we have left is take more of your questions, talk about how you can protect yourselves. Yes, ma'am. Every time you go into a medical establishment, whether it's for a brief exam type thing or whether it's for a hospital stay or no matter what it is, they ask you around every corner your date of birth. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, a lot of people are within hearing and you said all they need is your name, address, and your date of birth and they can find everything else. Yeah. And I mean, if you go into it, I mean, you don't have any choice. You have to give them your date of birth. Yeah. Let me start even from the beginning on this one. You know, we invented social security numbers back in the 30s, and it was a pretty good idea. In fact, social security numbers were designed partially to prevent identity theft, right? Because if I was John Smith, I could pretend to be the other John Smith and, you know, use John Smith's identity instead of my own. So we came up with a brilliant idea to create unique and individual numbers to, to identify all of our citizens so we couldn't impersonate each other. Well, of course, criminals have figured out how to, how to, they have to take more steps than they would if we didn't have those personally identifying numbers. They have to create fake identities. So um, as I keep saying, our information is out there. Your date of birth is everywhere. You send those items through the forms through the mail, you go to the clinic and they have your file behind the counter and it's not in a locked cabinet or anything like that, right? Even if it was, what if the workers at that, at that clinic were upset and they decide, or even, you know, someone came in on a Sunday morning to the clinic and said, Psst, hey, I'll give you 500 bucks if you give me a big stack of these files, right? So our information is out there, and it, the good news is, all our obligation is, is to monitor our financial transactions and check those credit reports. So <clears throat> a story about checking the credit report, I met a lady who retired from the YZ School District, and what did her employer do, this was years ago, but what did her employer do when uh, she retired but put her personnel file in the dumpster? And of course, someone dove in the dumpster and they stole the file and they had her identity. They also had access to her retirement accounts. 
she went to check her credit report months later and she found out that she owned two homes in uh, St. Louis Park. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't have known about those two homes without checking her credit report because uh, of course the mortgage bill wasn't coming to her address. And uh, the police, they were able to catch the criminals and uh, prosecuted them. She said it took her about five years to get her money back and that was half a million dollars. But she had those consumer protections in place um, that I've been talking about. Here's the opposite. Over in Belle Plaine, there uh, lived a single guy and two contractors came over to his house one day to do some repairs or something. They were trying to sell him something. One of them distracted him while the other one located his safe and they took the whole safe, half a million dollars, and it's gone. There's, in, without being able to identify and catch those criminals, there's no consumer protections. So it's safer to use fi uh, electronic transactions than it is to keep your half a million in a safe. No one's watching that. No one's protecting you from that theft. But it's the financial institutions who are responsible otherwise. Yes? Okay, I've just done my phone recording at 9.46 a.m. It goes, score alert notice. Uh, attention, your scores were recently changed. Now, score alert update. Is this legit? No, I'm thinking. I just was going to delete it, but it just came through. So okay. it's, a, it's sort of an unsolicited email. You don't recognize it, and it says score alert, whatever that is. So, you know, it, sound, it could be a phishing scheme. They're saying, your credit score has recently changed, changed, and that catches your attention, right? Maybe my identity's been stolen. Maybe someone is out there, you know, they created a new credit card in my name. Um, unless it's your bank or some, you've signed up for some service, sounds like a phishing scheme to me. Maybe it could be as simple as enter your credit card number here and we'll tell you who is using your identity, right? Yeah, very simple. So that brings me to so the discussion about LifeLock or these credit monitoring services, Did we, we didn't already talk about this? No. Okay, good. I, whether it was yesterday three times or this morning already at 7 a.m., I get mixed up sometimes. But um, I call LifeLock, like, it's like the Jiffy Lube system of identity protection. You might know how to change your own oil, but you pay Jiffy Lube to do it for you just because it's convenient. So, you know, LifeLock isn't doing anything you couldn't do for yourself. And, the, and there are many other, many other identity protection services being advertised. They're not doing anything you couldn't do for yourself. Um, you give them information about your accounts and it's an extra person or system that's paying attention to your spending habits. And you might like to pay for that. You might like to pay for that. They recently had to settle a lawsuit because they were advertising a million dollars worth of insurance against identity theft protection, right? You hear about this? Well, it was deemed to be, or they were charged with false advertising because they were pretending or, or saying, I, I, they settled the lawsuit so I can't say they were you know, guilty of something, but uh, they had to settle it because um, they're not you know, you send a million dollars to Jamaica, you don't get a million dollars back. What that protection does is they'll pay what fees you have to pay to restore your identity, whether that's postage to send in your forms, or maybe you need a lawyer to give you some advice. That's what that insurance covers if you pay for it. And even so, you might check your homeowner's policy and it might include identity theft fee protection. So. Uh, yeah, and Frank Abagnale says he uses an identity uh, theft system. He pays for it, and if you got money like he has, then you can too. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else with questions? About the uh, IRS uh, thing where they get your numbers. I know right now I have some of my been compromised. Is that right? So Someone filed, filed your taxes. I got a special number at the front of my. Yeah. Forms now, so anybody else? Yeah, so it's commonly happening. So what is what is happening is people are going to file their tax return, and the IRS says, well, someone already filed your taxes in your name. And 
the best advice the IRS is giving us is to do it early. Be, you know, do it before the con artists get to you. It's very, you don't need very much information to file taxes in someone else's name. You need their social security number, their date of birth, and their name, and that's it. You don't need their address. There's a box on the form you check if you have a new address in 2015. You don't need their W-2s. You would just uh, take a wild guess at what their income might be, choose an income that wouldn't raise any red flags, you know, $45,000 or something like that, and the computer system is going to accept that. And then at the bottom of the form, it asks you, where would you like your direct deposit to go? And I, if I was a con artist, I would put my own bank account right on that line. And the IRS is going to pay that refund, and they're not going to audit it until later. So they pay the refund before they verify it. That's how it works. And that bank account that I directly deposit your refund into, I've set that up with a fake identity, which also isn't hard to do. What I would use my personal computer to create a Minnesota ID or an ID from some other state, very easy to do. Um, I would find someone's social security number. I might disguise myself to look like that person if I was actually using a real person, or I might just have a, uh, access to one of those social security numbers of a deceased person that the Social Security Administration hasn't cleaned up yet. Um, and I would just have to sweat it out at the bank for 15 minutes or so while I set up a new account. Then I would file tax returns and that person's name. I'd understand sort of the red flags at the bank so I wouldn't get too greedy. Um, and then I'd go close that account on a Sunday morning and I'd already have my plane ticket in hand and I would be on my way. Mm -hmm. You had a question? Um, if you want to get a report from Experian or TransUnion or any of those places, um, either have to call and give your give your all of your pertinent secure information over the phone, yes. or you have to give it in writing. Right. So is that even safe? Yeah, I haven't heard of cases of, you know, some of one of the credit reporting bureaus, you know, giving up access to people's personal information. Yeah, I wouldn't, if I was going to put it in writing, I wouldn't put it in my mailbox with the sucker flag up telling everyone to come steal my information. You know, it's, it's. I haven't heard of a single case of anyone's phone being tapped. So you're having a conversation on the phone uh, with someone and there's a third party listening. That doesn't happen. Um, so it's relatively safe to be giving your personal information over the phone. Even if it's yeah. On a yeah. What about yeah. If it's on a coordinate that? Yeah, it's, I haven't heard of anything like that. Again, it comes back to monitoring those accounts. So even if someone was tapping your phone, you know, some foreign government is tapping our phones in Cannon Falls or something. We're not liable for it as long as we monitor our accounts. And now, when I do this presentation years ago, I used to have this long list of every agency that has a role in investigating financial crime. And if it's an internet crime, you go here. If it's an investment crime, you go there. And if it's US mail, you go somewhere else. There's so many different agencies. Always start with your local law enforcement. They need to know if you're being targeted, if you've been victimized. They might not be able to investigate it or catch the criminals who are in a foreign country, but they need to know about it. Our solution to the fact that people like you and me would have no idea where to go if, on a lot of different crimes is we have an 800 number, and it's staffed by our volunteers who um, can help you navigate the issues if you've been victimized, if you just have questions about certain scams, if you want to report a scam, um, if you want to know what number to call to check your credit report, if you want to know how to get on the do not call list, and it's 877-908-3360, and it's on the red stripe in your brochure, brochure here too. And if you want to follow up with me, my information is on the back. Checking your credit report is going to be enlightening. You'll realize you had lines of credit open in the past that you forgot about. Um, 
So it's, it's annualcreditreport.com is the website to check. And there's three different credit reporting bureaus. You can check your report with each of them once. One, well, you get one from each of them once a year. So you could check it for free every four months by choosing one of each of them every four months. And <clears throat> number one, beware when you do an internet search for free credit report, <coughs> because there are a lot of for-profit organizations that will check your credit for you. So it's like a third party that you pay to do what you could do for free. So it's annualcreditreport.com and make sure you don't click on one of the ads that you'd have to pay for. Now, those three credit reporting bureaus aren't going to give you your credit score. You'd have to pay for that. But your credit score doesn't, unless you're getting a loan, that's not what we're after here. Uh, what you're after is to see what lines of credit are open in your name. Where's your bank account? What credit cards do you have? What other loans do you have? And does someone have one open that you don't know about? So you do need to check all three of those agencies? They're all the same. The point is that you can do it for free with each of them sort of in a rotating order and do it more frequently than if you check them all at once. Yeah. Do you have to use a computer for that? No, there's a phone number. I don't have it on hand, but you could call these folks and they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, it's a good thing to do. You might own two homes that you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not paid. For. You could just move right in, take your vacations in St. Louis Park. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, recently, in the last month, I had, had to call, and I can't remember the type of organization I called, and and I had to get some information, and they asked for the last four digits of my social security number, and I said, I'm not comfortable giving that. Well, we need to have that get to look this up. I said, I'm not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And so then they said, well, then we have to have your date of birth. And whatever it was, I, I wish I could remember the information. Whatever it was, I needed, I needed access to that information. Sure. So I ended up giving my date of birth, being very uncomfortable with it, because I had my name and address. And I figured, yeah, they could probably look up my social security number. What do you do in those kinds of cases? I'll say it again, you check your accounts, you monitor your accounts, and you uh, check your credit report. There are certain business tra transactions that require our social security number, that require our date of birth. Some of them don't, like there was a time when, you know, the bagel shop was asking for social security numbers, because that's the number they wanted to use to track their customers. They don't do that anymore. You don't have to give your social security number to get a bagel. You do have to give your social security number to open a bank account, to get a credit card, to get a home loan. That's your identification number. You know, your Medicare number is your social security number. I'm proud to say that we, AARP, uh, was successful in changing that. Uh, new Medicare beneficiaries have a different, unique number now and sort of retroactively, all of you who have been on Social Security for a while will get a new number eventually by 2018. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, to, you have to use your Social Security number sometimes. And because of that, your identity is at risk. And the way, your obligation is to monitor those accounts. Mm -hmm. Sure. This is kind of, I think it's an unusual situation. I don't know if you've heard of this happening before. I sold my home. Okay. Everything was free and clear on the home. Um, I moved up here and I get a phone call from Edina Title. You weren't honest when you filled out the paperwork selling your home. There was a lien on the property. And I said, no, there's no lien on the property. I said, I've got the paperwork from that was done when my husband and I bought the property in, you know, years ago. So if there's a lien on it, it's since then. And I'm sorry, we never had any kind of a lien on that property. 
So now, I'm, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure out, and basically I was told, you just sit and let us do it and we'll get back to you. You know, so I have no idea where it's at. Yeah, that seems particularly suspicious because some transactional records like that are public, such as property transfers. So a third party can see the fact that you sold a home or bought, purchased a home, and con artists might look that up and just try to strong arm someone and say, you know, there's a lien on this property, you got to pay it right now. You know, you're, there's going to be a lot of trouble, it's going to be a big hassle, but you can just pay it right now, right? You know, car, car sales are, or car titling is a similar public transaction. So those warranty deals, you hear those warrant, they, your, your warranty expires and they're calling you to sell the, you this extended warranty. The reason that, that they focus on that tactic is because they have access to those records and the average person is thinking, well, this must be true. Who would know that my warranty ex expired, right? So, yeah, anybody could if they cared to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think let's uh, wrap it up, and I'll be here cleaning up all the all of this for a while. So, if you have other questions, we can talk about those too. Thanks. <laughs>